Alright friend, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Collaborative and MagicBrad.com and I've got a friend, his name is Gary Sirak. He's with, uh, he's in the financial world. Are you there Gary? Oh I am. We Brad. hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear. <laughs> well I'm up here in Minneapolis, we chatted a little earlier. You're, you said you're from Ohio, right? Yeah, Canton, Ohio, home yeah. of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And there's that joke about what's round on the outside and high in the middle? Uh, I don't know what that joke is. Ohio! Oh, that one. <laughs> that one. I know that one. So. And the crowd goes wild. They do. I got one of these things. <laughs> yeah. They go wild. They really so, Gary, I don't do these too long because we got that precious commodity of time that we all have the exact same amount, but it disappears every day. So uh, we do these kind of short and sweet and to the point. But the first thing is, who's Gary? You married? You got kids? You single? Wild, crazy guy? What? Uh, you got pets? What are you? Who are you? Um, no pets. A son that lives in uh, Keystone, Colorado, up in the mountains. He's a ghost writer. And I have a wife that's been married to me for 42 years, so it's a woman of incredible patience. Uh, <laughs> we've always lived here. <coughs> Excuse me. And I've, I've taken over our family business uh, about 20 years ago. My dad started our business 60 years ago. And I became the heir apparent uh, by default and ended up running this financial services company. It's been fascinating. You know, a little bit on that topic of finances, I find it's very interesting that sometimes people just don't like talking about their money. And I have a theory about it that money is just a byproduct of energy or work. And it's just a measurement system for the stuff that we do. So I think that some of the reason people are sometimes uncomfortable talking about their money is because it's like them. What do you think of that? Well, I think uh, a lot of that because I wrote my first book called If Your Money Talks, what secrets would it tell? And I wrote that about five years ago, so it kind of hits exactly the point you're making. Fascinating, interesting to see what people do about their money, how they feel about it, how they spend it, um, how they're planning for their future or not planning, and, and their attitudes about money, just uh, very diverse. Well, you know, it's really kind of creepy that, like, when I was a kid, I didn't care about saving money, but dang, I wish I would have put, put a quarter away every day. <laughs> I was different than you, Brad. I was, a, every time I read a book, my parents gave me a nickel. A nickel wasn't much money, but when I was a kid, this was going back a long way, a nickel was okay, and, and I kept it. And I would get the 10 bucks, I'd go to the bank. So I've always been a little strange with money. Even as a little kid, I just thought it was kind of cool to have 10 bucks in the bank. Well, the, the compounding thing is amazing. That most like the whole a penny doubled every day, and people just don't even think about that. Think, well, a penny, it's not that big a deal. But it can add up if it compounds. <laughs> oh, it can add up. We, we do a lot with investments in 401ks. And it's absolutely imperative that people start as soon as possible because the time factor of that money, the compound factor, it blows away. Even if you double or triple what you're going to put away in the last 10 years, you'll never overcome if you started early properly. Well, what's your suggestion for people that uh, didn't start early? Because you can't go back, you know? No, but I, I have some clients of mine, literally, they came to me and said, hey, we're going to retire in five years. I said, well, why don't you just load up your 401k? Why don't you just really take a bunch of money, as much as you can afford, throw it in there, and at least have something down the road? Because right now, you're going to be living on Social Security in about 400 bucks a month. Not good. Do you do, uh, do anything in the world of REITs, real estate investment trusts? I have owned a few, sold a few in my day. Um, I like real estate a lot. I'm a big fan of real estate. So to me, it's, it's certainly a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, well, I, I used to produce expos and trade shows, and we were making really good money, and we had a SEP, and I didn't know where to put it because I didn't understand all that stock, bond, trade thing. So I just put it in real estate because, like you said, I'm a, fan, I'm a fan also because you got to have a roof over your head. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, you got to have security. And, and REITs is... Uh, the stuff I'm in, at least, is commercial, residential, it's storage lockers, it's shopping malls, it's apartment complexes, retirement homes, vacation homes. So it's really diversified in something that we all have to have, and that's a roof over our head. Fairly secure. I love having roofs overhead, and, and I like real estate, so what you're describing to me is very appealing. So we, we work in that, that area a bit. Uh, and the people, that's a timing game, too. As long as you're not in too much of a hurry and you have patience, you, you can make money in that world. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there was, what was it, 2008 or something when a bunch of real estate kind of collapsed and stuff. Yeah, I remember and, reading about that. Yeah. That was pretty ugly. So. You know, when I did my uh, expo business, it actually worked for us because a lot of, uh, um, like, contracting, uh, remodeling companies, they had to lay a lot of their people off. And the people they laid off started their own businesses, so we have more exhibitors out of it than, than we lost. <laughs> yeah, we actually did quite well out of it also, which was kind of unique. Um, people came to us and said, okay, uh, I just lost a lot of money. How do I keep from ever doing that again? Can you help me? And, and so our philosophy was we're very conservative anyway. So. Well, you know, that's because so. from your point of view, you've got that knowledge that you can actually make money when things are bad if you know what you're doing. But the 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 basic person's brain thinks, how can you make any money when the economy's bad? Correct. They don't think about that. So and it, that you hit it, you hit it right on the head. You guys, you guys know that kind of stuff where the other person, the average person doesn't understand it. That's why we're an advocate of using experts. <laughs> we should be. Um, hey, you've got, we are, so. And you guys got your finger on the pulse of the industry, whereas someone that has got a job, they got, they're busy doing their job, they can't watch all their stuff all the time and know what's going to be happening when a war breaks out and all that kind of stuff. Well, I had a client in last week, she and her husband, and she came to me and said, I want to buy a fixer-upper. And she had found one that was 100 grand. And I looked at her and I said, can I ask you some questions? She said, sure. I said, have you ever done one of those? No. I said, what do you know about it? I said, well, I don't really know much about any of the particulars. And I said, so why are you doing this? And she said, well, and I said, can I give you an answer before you think of one? She said, yeah. I said, you're just bored to death. And she looked at me and said, oh my God, that's it. I said, well, let's do something that doesn't cost a hundred grand that you don't have to be bored to death. Let's find something less expensive for you to do that will maybe not get pounded. Because I, I think people who buy fixer-uppers and don't know how to do it and are not going to do any of the work and have a management company, they're going to have some problems. Yeah, see, that's um, I, I talked with someone that did the same kind of thing because in their head they think that getting into real estate and doing this fix and flip thing, if you don't know what, the, what it's going to cost you to put a new roof on, so you got to know what you're doing when you get into stuff just because people make, like, I don't know where you are with this whole Bitcoin thing, but I think a lot of people lost a lot of their money from scammers that did all this crazy stuff because there's such a frenzy for it. Yeah, I'm always a little leery of things that are bright and shiny. And yeah. to me, Bitcoin was very bright and shiny, and I backed away from it until I could really understand it. Um, it it's hard to understand, by the way. There's a so reason. you said you wrote a book. Do you, do you have a copy of your book? or maybe? It's called The American Dream Revisited. And it's actually for entrepreneurs and people that are looking and trying to figure out what their American dream is, if they even have one, or if it's even achievable. So when I wrote this, my goal was to let people know there's hope. And, and if they find something they really are passionate about and it gives them purpose, uh, pursue it. The end results could be actually very, very nice. I think that's a pretty interesting title in that the American dream used to be that get married, have a dog, and a couple kids in a white picket fence, and those days have kind of gone where the eight-hour workday is gone. <laughs> oh, totally. And, and the funny thing is I interviewed 25 people across the country, and I wrote 13 stories. And what I found out in all of these stories, it was all about food, clothing, and shelter. It was never about getting rich. It was nothing like that. It was just... You know, how do I provide for my family? How to provide for myself? Can I keep paying rent on my apartment? You know, what do I do? You know, do I lose my mortgage? It's really very interesting to listen to 13 people from all over the world and how they figured it out. Right. So before I get into my favorite question, you want to let us know how we can get a hold of you. You got an easy to remember website or something like that. And then I'll also embed that with the video and stuff when I propagate this stuff out. So what, what, what kind of website? How do we get a hold of you? I have two of them, GarySurak.com, and the other one is SurakFinancial.com. And both of those get to me. They seem to find me so when they do that. So. Surak is S-I-R-A-K. Pretty easy. Gary Surak, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, well, here's my favorite question, then we'll sign this off and propagate it out. It's the big Y question, the big W. Why are you doing this? And you kind of answered it already, but uh, why are you doing this as opposed to being a... Uh, gym teacher or <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be very good at that. a ski I like instructor. Uh, speaking, 
you know, the basketball they're on tonight. That's going to be very exciting. But nonetheless, I, I really got involved with this because the job I was doing before, I didn't feel like I had any purpose. And I wasn't passionate about it. I was good at it. And I made very good money. But I, too, was very bored. And so I decided my next job, whatever that would be, it would impact people in a positive way and I could help change their life. So that's really been my motto, and I, I uh, have followed it for 30-some years. Got it. Well, I'm going to sign this off and put it in the can, as they say, and beam it up to the Internet. And I appreciate you, Gary, taking the time to be on Synergy Cafe. And like I said, if you've got something more on a specific niche and you want to do one of these again and target a, a specific demographic or a geographic area, we can make that happen. So I enjoy um, you taking yeah, the time. Brad, I like that. We'll, we'll definitely do one on the book thing. I like that idea. I think you'll find it interesting how it all happens. Okie doke. Thanks, Gary. Thank Enjoy. You. Peace. Bye. Take care.